Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Shepherd of the Valley Eastern Church. As I mentioned two weeks ago, uh, we moved the congregation back a little bit so that I can take the mask off for the service of the word so that you're able to hear me better and so that the recording uh, for those that are at home pick it, picks up better. A couple of other announcements. Uh, one, uh, as you're walking up for communion today, we're going to actually be very careful. The trees are at the time of the year when they're dropping lots of pods and things and, and the squirrels have eaten some of these things and made them very hazardous for tripping. So be careful as you're walking across the lawn. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I'm going to invite you at the very end of the service today, right after the benediction, to come with me. And we're going to go into the sanctuary and around the perimeter of the sanctuary. We'll spread ourselves out. The quilters have laid out all their quilts like they do every year. But unfortunately, since we can't be in there this year and they have to ship them out this week, we'd like to go in there and uh, say a prayer and dedicate them uh, and bless them as they go out. And also say a prayer that we're able to return inside soon. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but uh, this last uh, week we were told that it, on Tuesday, uh, our county is able to go into the orange tier that we will be able to return inside for worship. And so we're prayerful that by next Sunday we'll be back in the sanctuary. If we do go back into the sanctuary uh, next Sunday, uh, I will send out a mass email. Well, Brian will send it out, I'll send it to him, he'll send it to you. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a cleanup time next week on Wednesday. And if you're able to come by and, and help us clean out the sanctuary just a little bit, get it ready for the weekend, that'd be great. So that being said, you should have received the order of worship for today. We want to begin with the opening hymn, O Bless the Lord My Soul. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. earth. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy for the sake of a holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God as long as I have my being. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God as long as I have my being. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. We continue our catechism in the Lord's Prayer. What is the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil people. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. What is meant by daily bread? Daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support or needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, a devout husband or wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading. <clears throat> the Old Testament reading comes to us from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. He will command his angels concerning you. To guard you in all your ways. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul. And, and all, all that, that is within me, me bless, bless his, his holy name. name. The epistle reading comes to us from the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory, Glory be to thee, O Lord. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads, and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We join together in confessing our faith using the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the sermon hymn, Spread the Reign of God the Lord.
and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's message comes to us from our gospel lesson out of Matthew and it's the last verse of the lesson. For many are invited but few are chosen. That's part of the text. My dear friends in Christ, if we were to attempt to give a nifty little title to each of the gospel writers, it might sound something like this. We could call Mark the Tom Thumb Gospel. Why? Because it's the shortest of the Gospels. We could call Luke the Stickler Gospel, because Luke is all about the details. We could call John either the Tylenol or Excedrin Gospel, depending on your preference, because above all others, this Gospel makes you think and think hard. That leaves us only with Matthew and there are many names we could give Matthew, and I've chosen one for today that fits our text, and that is the Spoonful of Sugar Gospel. I say that because Matthew uses parables throughout its text to help the medicine of unpleasant truths go down. Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding banquet, fits that description pretty good. There is within this parable an unpleasant truth that we are allowed to digest by the spoonful of sugar known as the parable. And that unpleasant truth that the parable of the wedding banquet in Matthew 22 teaches us is this. Many are invited, but few are chosen. Earlier in the gospel, in chapter seven of Matthew, we heard something similar. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Matthew's repetitive point is that few will enter into eternal life. While that may be difficult to hear, I bet it doesn't shock you. You live in a world where you know this to be true. And if you don't, I would like to take you through a little experiment right now. I want you to imagine the five houses from your house to the right, the five houses to the left, and five houses directly across the street. So 15 houses total. Of those houses that surround your house, how many of those people would know that Jesus died for them, that Jesus rose for them, that they have eternal life? How many of them believe it? Now maybe you happen to live in a particularly holy cul-de-sac. I don't know. So try this on, these statistics. In 2016, about 331 million people lived in America. In that same year, a survey was taken and 40% of those 331 million people claimed to be very religious. That same survey asked the question, do you believe in hell? 62% of the total respondents said they believed in hell. That got me thinking. I'm not a math wizard, but 40% that are religious, 62% believe in hell. I'm wondering what that 22% difference is. What do they think is going to happen? Do they just not care that they're going to hell? Do they think there's nothing they can do about it? Hell exists. That's also a hard truth to swallow, an unpleasant truth. But it does. 
And Matthew teaches us that the path to hell is wide and the gate to heaven narrow. I saw a meme not that long ago on Facebook that said this, the fact that there is a highway to hell and only a stairway to heaven might tell us of something about expected traffic patterns. That's pretty good. It's pretty accurate. That's pretty Mathean, as it were. We joke about it, and yet hell is real. There's a part of us that acknowledges that. But the idea of so many people going there is difficult for us to swallow. And so even within Christianity, there has been a seeping universalism, a notion that while God has moved me to have faith in Jesus Christ, perhaps, perhaps, there is still some hope for others, some second chance that they will be given. And yet the Bible teaches no such thing. Only through Jesus are we saved, and once we die, we face judgment. It's that plain, that straightforward. There is no notion of a second chance or alternate path anywhere in the scriptures. This spoonful of sugar parable doses us with that unpleasant truth that hell is real and many are on the road there. Perhaps the unpleasantness of what this parable teaches has forced us to focus on other parts of the parable that aren't quite so difficult. We don't want to think about the unthinkable, so we spend our efforts turning the parable into some sort of children's song. So a song about people who cannot come to the banquet because, well, they have gotten married or they've bought the cow. I know you know the song, right? But that makes too light of it. Beneath all that playfulness lies the real reason that Jesus tells the parable. And it comes at the very end. It's his punchline, but it's no joke. Many are invited, but few are chosen. The parable itself is filled with invitations. The king repeatedly invites. He sends his servants to invite people to the banquet. The servants in the parable are the prophets in the first half of the parable. And yet the prophets, having gone out at God's behest to invite the children of Israel, meet three different kinds of refusals, and they're all laid out here in the parable. The first servant prophets meet people who simply refuse the invitation. They were those in the Old Testament that had refused God and given themselves over to Baal, Mordach of the Babylonians, and of course the golden calf. They chose other gods and left the true God behind. In our own day, there are many who have chosen idols over the true God, idols of money, status, their own time, even idols of their own immorality. After all, following the true God would cramp their lifestyle. And yet we must also admit that even among us, there are minor idolatries. Every sin we commit is a breaking of the first commandment. It's an exercising of our will over God's. Still, in the parable, God is gracious, and he sends out even more servant prophets with even more invitations. But now the refusal comes in the form of the business of life. For these Jews, religion is a side hobby and not to be all-consuming. Of course, we have many in the world today who refuse the gracious invitation of God in just this way. Religion is for when I get old. Religion is for when I'm sick or need it. I'm too busy now making my money. I'm too busy now leading my life. I will have time for faith later on. I will have time for faith when I have time for faith. Too often they decide that their time is not, too often they find out that their time is not theirs to decide. And the decision is made for them. And they're confronted by the unpleasant truth of death. Finally, in the parable, there is a third refusal of the invitation and it's actually the most heinous one because they not only refused the invitation brought by these servant prophets but they went so far as to kill the messengers themselves long is the list of prophets that have been killed or stoned or beaten for what they brought in the grace in grace from the lord and now more than ever there are people that are not only non-christian in our world but anti-christian they would seek the church's removal from public life entirely. I'd like to give you good news and say it'll get better just around the corner. I'd like to break into little orphan Annie and the sun will come out tomorrow. But that's not the truth for the church. 
the truth for the church is things will not markedly improve until Christ returns. Then they will improve entirely and perfectly. Then all things will be made new. And yet Christ will come and make things new for the church, but he will judge those who have refused the invitation, who have killed and beaten his servants. That brings us to about halfway through the parable. And the news hasn't been good so far. And yet, God in his graciousness has repeatedly invited and invited and invited, reached out to his people, but they have refused. But now the invitation is going to go out beyond God's people of the Old Testament. Hear where the parable goes next. The king said, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet any you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled. This, of course, is the New Testament turn in the parable. Now the invitation goes out beyond the children of Israel to all Gentiles, to you and I. The invitation goes out through the apostles, through the church, to all nations. Notice especially that both the good and the bad are invited. God doesn't wait for us to clean up our lives to offer us his grace. In his grace, in Jesus Christ, he makes us clean enough to attend the wedding banquet. Banquet. That brings us really to the last section of the parable, and perhaps the most difficult part. The wedding hall is full, but as the king enters, he notices a man not wearing wedding clothes. Now, a little bit of history here. There is some evidence that at the time of Jesus, the host would often provide garments for his wedding guests, outfits for them to wear for the feast. Especially here, since many of the guests were coming in directly from the streets, from the highways and byways, according to the song, they wouldn't have the proper attire. The parallel to us is pretty obvious. On our own, we would not be able to so clothe ourselves to be worthy of entering the wedding hall of God. Our sinful rags and even our good works simply don't measure up. Yet in Christ, we are clothed and made ready for the banquet. Paul tells us in Galatians 3, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Through our baptism, we are made ready for the final wedding banquet with Christ. Through our baptism, we are made into the few that are chosen. The man who wasn't wearing the wedding clothes was a hypocrite, an imposter. By refusing the wedding clothes of the host, he showed his hypocrisy. You and I have been clothed with Christ. We are ready for the wedding banquet. So then we come to the conclusion of what should you and I walk away with in considering this parable. And I would ask that you walk away with these three things. First, we should recognize the constant inviting grace of God. God has invited and invited and invited people to salvation through Jesus Christ. The gospel has gone out. The invitations have been sent. We have a gracious and forgiving God who wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. His grace has come to you and it comes to you again and again in times like this through word and sacrament. Second, many, many people will refuse the invitation and will wind up in hell. We must stop wincing at hearing that word because you see them every day. Some of them flat out refuse the grace of God and pursue other idols. Some of them are too busy and consumed by life's affairs to consider the invitation. Some of them, and more all the time, are hostile to the invitation and wish the church and its message to simply go away. Quite sadly, many, many people are heading to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. These first two things we should walk away with lead us inevitably to the final thing, the third thing I want you to remember. Since God is a gracious God and wants all people to be saved, and since many are refusing the invitation and don't yet know Christ, we must continue to get the message out. That's the third thing to walk away with. There must be an urgency to our mission, an urgency to our evangelism. Don't assume that the person you know who doesn't know Christ will hear it from someone else. Don't assume they've heard it before, and that is enough. Don't assume that the Holy Spirit would never use you that way. God is gracious and reaches out through imperfect vessels like you, 
and I. Through us, the invitation goes out. Through us, the gospel goes forth. Through us, others will be invited to the wedding feast of God. And the invitation must go out because the time is short. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God is past all understanding. Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. continue with the prayer of the church since we have been invited by God's word and, and encouraged by his promise of mercy let us offer a prayer to the Lord O Lord we pray for the church for the leaders of the church for all pastors and missionaries for those preparing for church vocations for those considering full-time church service Lord in your mercy hear our prayer O Lord we pray for the blessing of marriage and the faithfulness of husbands and wives for the children entrusted to their care, for loving care of children who have suffered abuse or neglect, and for those who open their homes to children in foster care. We pray for a welcoming spirit in our own congregation, for boldness in our invitation to those without a church home, and for a willingness to serve our neighbor in need and the stranger who, lit, who crosses our paths. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we pray for, for compassion toward the sick and those who suffer for our care of those who need our assistance, for the hospitalized and those recovering. We pray that you give them strength and peace. In these difficult times, we pray for our elected and appointed civil servants, for all judges and magistrates, for all emergency personnel, for all members of the armed forces, and for all us as citizens and neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Oh Lord, we pray for our communion upon the body and blood of the Lord, and for hearts that burn with desire for the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom without end. We also pray for those preparing for baptism, for the catechumens, and for the places where we gather to teach and learn God's word. We pray for gratitude in receiving the Lord's gifts and blessings, for generosity in sharing these resources with those in need, and for the tithes and offerings to support the work of the kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things we pray, and also those things which we name now silently before you. All these things, Lord, we pray you to grant us according to your mercy in Jesus Christ, and to fill us with contentment, that trusting in your gracious will, for all things our hearts may enjoy perfect rest and peace, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Continue with the service of the sacrament, beginning with the preface. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. <clears throat> Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is me and right, right so to do. do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The one this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and, ma we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 holy Lord God, God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, our Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, our Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, our Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace. Amen. <clears throat>
continue with the Nook Dimittis. Lord, now let us, thou thy servant, depart in peace. According to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which, which thou hast prepared, prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you of his peace. Amen. Amen. I would now invite you to come with me uh, into the sanctuary and around the outside of the sanctuary. You spread yourselves out uh, so we can have a couple of prayers in there. <clears throat> 